Very good morning. You're watching NDTV 247. I'm Divya Vadwa. Let's get to your top story. And in a historic decision at the beginning of the United Nations Climate Change Conference in the United Arab Emirates, nearly 200 nations have reached an agreement to establish a fund to assist countries grappling with the effects of global warming. The Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, arrived in Dubai last night calling for climate financing as well as technology transfer to developing nations, empowering them to effectively confront the challenges posed by climate change. Looking forward to the proceedings of the summit, which are aimed at creating a better planet, is how the Prime Minister has described the summit that he will be attending this morning. The Prime Minister has underscored the significance of COP28 as a platform to review the process, the progress that was made under a Paris Agreement, and charter a course for future climate action. The climate talks in Dubai come at a very critical junction as a global emissions continue to surge. The United Nations announced just yesterday that this year is on track to be the hottest year in recorded history, highlighting the urgency for immediate action, the establishment of a loss and damage fund, as well as long advocated for by climate vulnerable nations, marked an early victory as far as COP28 is concerned. This is said to become the biggest climate conference in history with that will host over 140 heads of state and government, double the attendance from what uh, was at COP27 last year. Now, these high-level leaders will deliver speeches throughout today as well as tomorrow. It's a two-day event with Britain's King Charles III officially opening the event with a ceremonial address. The UAE hopes to spearhead an agreement to triple renewable energy capacity and double the annual pace of energy efficiency improvement by 2030. The Prime Minister will be attending that summit and not just the summit. He has three other events planned in the course of the day. What are those events? My colleague Ghazali has the details. So Prime Minister Narendra Modi has arrived here in the hotel in Dubai and what you'll see here behind me are the people of the Indian diaspora who are waiting here. The Prime Minister will meet them and, and you can see those loud cheers here as usual on his foreign trips. So this is also happening on the sidelines of the COP28 summit and why this is important because a major achievement is there for the, for the developing countries since the loss and damage fund has been established, has been approved, and billions of dollars have been pledged by the developed countries, which will be set up, the fund will be set up, and will be given to the developing countries to mitigate the climate crisis. But how is Prime Minister's visit important here? Because India has been among those developing countries which had been asking to set up those, uh, to set up that loss and damage fund. But also during this particular summit here, his presence, the Prime Minister's presence is important because Prime Minister Narendra Modi is also going to hold some bilateral talks here on the sidelines of the COP28 summit. Besides the COP28 summit, India is also going to co-host two other events with UAE, the main host of the COP28 summit. And also bilateral meets will be attended by the Prime Minister with a, a higher number of diaspora, Indian diaspora in UAE. It, is, it was expected that once he arrives, this sort of gathering will uh, uh, will be organized by the local embassy and the foreign affairs ministry uh, here in, in Dubai. And this is what you see behind me in the COP28 summit here in Dubai, that what is he going to uh, address there in the summit? And what are, what are the challenges for India, which he's going to address and the climate action, which India has taken in terms of mitigating the climate crisis. In Dubai, Mohammad Ghazali for NDTV. The India Pavilion at the COP28 summit in Dubai, showcasing India's climate action. Prime Minister Modi has an action-packed agenda in Dubai. He will take forward India's emphasis on climate action and climate justice. Apart from his address at the opening session, Prime Minister Modi will also participate in three high-level side events, two of which are being co-hosted by India. The first high-level event which is being co-hosted by India and the UAE is the launch of Green Credits Initiative. The Green Credits Initiative is based on the Green Credit Program and basically envisions the issue of Green Credits for plantations on waste and degraded lands and the river catchment areas in order to restore their vitality. The second side event, co-hosted by India and Sweden, is the launch of LEED IT 2.0, a 
essentially a leadership group for industry transition. This joint initiative was launched in 2019 at the UN Climate Action Summit in New York. It fosters collaboration among the decision makers, bringing together both the public sector and the private sector with the objective of accelerating the industry transition to net zero emissions, essentially from heavy industries. On the agenda at the COP28 are fast-tracking energy transition, fixing climate finance, climate financing strategies as well as loss and damage compensation. We have uh, always been interested in finding a successful outcome on operationalizing the loss and damage fund. We think this will be of great benefit to the developing countries uh, by providing them with potentially a new source of uh, financial support to address the loss and damage uh, aspect related to this. Among the sticky issues that India will look to defend at COP28 are the phasing out of fossil fuels, especially coal and curbing methane emissions. The latter is linked to agricultural practices including rice cultivation. India maintains coal is and will remain an important part of India's energy mix as it moves ahead with its developmental priorities. India will also continue to stress on the Global South view on climate finance and justice. As the summit begins in the shadow of continuous global conflict, the experts believe that the leaders who are attending this summit will now take action to achieve the environmental goals set in the summit. At COP28 summit in Dubai, Mohammad Ghazali for NDTV. Now in the battle for states, the votes are in and the exit polls are out before the counting that takes place on the 3rd of December, that's Sunday. According to the exit polls, the edge to Congress in two out of the five states. The BJP may win two out of the five states as well, so that's going to be a close contest. An aggregate of exit polls is predicting two strikes out of the three in the heartland states for the BJP, while Chhattisgarh's chief minister, Pupesh Baghel, gets to retain his job. On the other side, uh, his uh, counterpart in Rajasthan, Ashok, Gehlot might just lose is what uh, is being indicated that revolving door politics is to stay as far as the state of Rajasthan is concerned. There also seems a high possibility that Madhya Pradesh could go to the BJP again. The biggest upset though could be reserved for Telangana's KCR's BRS. Uh, well, uh, that, and uh, Mizoram uh, might just be a hung government is uh, what is uh, being predicted by the exit polls. My colleague Vishnu has all the details. Well, hello and welcome. What we're going to now bring you is a look at a poll of polls. What exactly are the various exit polls saying about the election results or potential election results, I should say, in the five states? So let's start with Rajasthan. This is the NDTV poll of polls, an aggregate of what all the various polls, there are approximately eight of them. Uh, this says that in Rajasthan, the BJP appears to have an edge with 104, the Congress and its allies, 85. Others uh, at 10, remember the magic mark is 100, 199 seats. Should be mentioned right up off the top that this does account uh, for outliers as well. In other words, a couple of exit polls which had fairly significant uh, gains for one party or the other. Therefore, uh, it does include that. If those were excluded, then the numbers might be a little bit closer. But be that as it may, the exit poll of polls in the state of Rajasthan has the BJP at 104 clearly ahead. Let's quickly move on now to uh, the next state, Madhya Pradesh, and it is an extremely interesting election over here. It seemed to be quite close, but again, it is, according to the poll of polls, the BJP at 124, the Congress at 102. The Congress party says, no, this is not going to take place at all. The BJP insists and says that come Sunday, we're telling you we're going to be coming to power in the state. Again, this takes into account a couple of outliers. In the absence of that, it would be fairly close, perhaps neck and neck. Let's move to the next state now and uh, give you an idea of what's happening in the state of Chhattisgarh. Chhattisgarh is quite clear. No debate over here, no real outliers. Everybody seems to suggest that it is the Congress which will be uh, coming to power uh, quite comfortably, a simple majority over there. 
the magic mark, the majority figure, 46. They are uh, possibly going to be at 49. Let's see what finally takes place. Let's move on to the state of Telangana, and this is where there's been a great surprise. The BRS won a landslide victory last time around, but the Congress has quite clearly made inroads, and how the Congress and its allies at 62, a simple majority for them, the BRS, plummeting a couple of gains for the BJP and its allies. Remember, the BJP just about got off the mark last time around. They will do substantially better, but look at that. The Congress, after Karnataka, making strong inroads in another major South Indian state, the state of Telangana, which they appear to be poised to win. Let's take a look finally at the state of Mizoram in the northeast. There are lots of local factors over here. It's important to understand that despite the common belief that states of the northeast are all have follow common trends, common interests. In fact, the electoral politics of every state are quite distinct. Uh, the ZPM is the major factor over here at 17. It is a relatively new power, a political power, a new political party. And some would suggest that this is the old Congress in a new Aftar, several of the leaders having uh, crossed over the ruling MNF quite close at 14. So it's going to be close in the state of Mizoram as well. And in the homecoming of 40 out of the 41 workers who were rescued from Uttarakhand Tunnel as they got a clean shit at the Ames Hospital in Rishikesh, stating that they're physically normal and clinically stable. But one rescued worker, Pushkar Singh, is still under observation at Ames in Rishikesh for the treatment of a congenital medical condition. He has been accidentally uh, diagnosed uh, with atrial septal defect, an anomaly that is present at birth, according to the doctor. His physical condition and vitals are normal. He's been shifted from the disaster ward to the Department of Cardiology for further investigation. And this order is not, uh, this disorder is not related to the tunnel collapse, is what the doctors there are saying. Now, doctors from Ames Rishikesh will stay connected with all 41 workers through telemedicine in order to monitor their mental health for the next few weeks. But how are the uh, workers reacting now that uh, some of them have reached uh, Delhi and they're on the way home? They're saying that they were very scared for their lives. They had lost hope in the first 24 to 48 hours and how they would not be going back to the same profession. When you were in the tunnel, how did you feel? I was in the beginning, then I was happy. How did you get to 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 आप सत्रह दिन टनल के अंदर रहे कैसा अनुभव कर रहे थे आप कैसा लग रहा था आपको दो दिन तो निकलेंगे दो दिन उम्मीद नहीं था टेंशन में रहते थे कि निकल जी निकल पाएंगे कि नहीं निकल पाएंगे अभी तबीयत कैसी है आपकी अभी ठीक है तो अपने घर वालों से मिलके कैसा लग रहा है अच्छा लग रहा है बहुत अच्छा लग रहा है अब क्या उम्मीद करते हैं आगे और काम करेंगे या फिर कुछ और काम करेंगे नहीं टनल लाइन में नहीं करेंगे लाइन में काम नहीं करेंगे and so 40 of the 41 workers have uh, now made their way. They're waking their way home there. You can see some of them arriving at uh, railway stations. And uh, these are uh, visuals from Patna where you can see family members gathered with flowers and garlands uh, with all smiles and excitement in order uh, to welcome and receive their loved ones. Uh, just uh, they are waiting for their loved ones to arrive. Uh, so uh, with bated breath, uh, do remember it's been over 20 days now. It was 17 days of that tunnel collapse. It was on the 17th day that they were finally pulled out late at night at about 7.30, one by one, uh, 41 workers were pulled out. Just one of them is still at the Ames Hospital and that is because of a condition uh, which had nothing to do with the collapse, but it's uh, he's been shifted to the cardiology department a little while before he also gets home. For now, 40 workers are on their way home and there you can see the, their loved ones waiting there to welcome them back home. And with that, we're sitting into a short break. We'll be back with a whole lot more.
Welcome back. A major female feticide ring in Karnataka has got exposed by an accident vehicle check in Bengaluru. On the 15th of October, the police stopped a suspicious car and questioned two people inside who have now confessed to being part of the gang that has been involved in over 240 illegal abortions and over 900 sex determination tests for three years operating out of Mysuru and Mandya. The Karnataka Health Minister has announced that this case will be handed over to the CBI. This is uh, to uh, let's uh, just listen in uh, to what uh, is uh, being said by the police. Uh, as far as uh, uh, this case is concerned. And also we have my colleague Pratibha joining us. Pratibha, nine arrested in the sex determination racket, but there are more people involved in the racket who are absconding. That's right, nine so far and two more people involved in this particular racket. Whether there is a bigger thing that has to be exposed or not, several angles are being looked into here. But we are talking about two doctors and three lab technicians and two locals as well. So if you look at the modus operandi, uh, there are two agents who go around scouting for pregnant women and uh, looking for people who are vulnerable and uh, also uh, looking at people with uh, different kinds of mindsets where uh, people are extremely scared of having a female child in their womb. And uh, they target these people, bring them to a scanning center in the Mandya Mysuru region. It is an illegal uh, scanning center that has been uh, 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 present there for about three years. And once the uh, sex is determined, they take them to the doctor, uh, one named Mr. Chandan Balal and his wife who were running this hospital called Mata Hospital in that particular region. And they take them there and uh, illegal uh, uh, termination of pregnancies are also conducted. Now, the fact that this has been there, uh, the hospital has been existing for three years, has also uh, prompted the health minister to go there and uh, suspend uh, two health officers, one of the taluk and the other of the district as well. Now, how did they, uh, how did this go unnoticed for so long and uh, how an accidental vehicle checkup has uh, uh, resulted in this kind of a racket being busted? These are several questions now doing the rounds, whether there are other illegal rackets like this existing in different pockets of the state uh, is also another angle that is being explored. Right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Pratibha, for getting us all those details. Moving on to more news now and responding to questions on an alleged plot from India to murder US-based Khalistani terrorist uh, Pannu, the External Affairs Ministry today has said that it's a matter of concern and reiterated that New Delhi has launched a high-level probe into the charges. The ministry spokesperson was responding to media's questions on allegations that an Indian government employee worked with an Indian national, Nikhil Gupta, as well as others in a plot to assassinate Pannu. A day after the bombshell from the United States Justice Department accusing an Indian operator of being involved in a murder plot to eliminate a Sikh separatist on U.S. soil, a guarded response from New Delhi. In the course of discussions with the U.S. on bilateral security cooperation, distancing itself from allegations of a link to an attempted extrajudicial killing, the government says it has already formed a high-level committee looking into U.S. inputs on organized criminals, gun runners and terrorists. As regards the case against an individual that has been filed in a U.S. court, uh, allegedly linking him to an Indian official, this is a matter of concern. We have said, and uh, let me reiterate, that this is also contrary to government policy. The U.S. Attorney's Office in New York and the Justice Department has alleged an Indian national named Nikhil Gupta, now being held in the Czech Republic, was recruited to eliminate a Sikh extremist on U.S. soil. An Indian official, described as a senior field officer, directed the alleged plot. The hitman allegedly hired to carry out the job was in fact a US undercover police officer and the intermediary through whom the hitman was hired turned out to be a US government source. The allegations come at a time when Canada has accused India of having a hand in the murder of Sikh separatist Hardeep Singh Nijar in a Vancouver suburb in June. India needs to take this seriously. Today, Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said India needs to take the allegations he has raised seriously. Insofar as Canada is concerned, um, we, have, um, we have said that they have consistently given space to anti-India extremists and violence, and that is actually the heart of the issue. Uh, our diplomatic representatives in Canada have borne the brunt of this. So we expect the government of Canada to live up to its obligations under the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. 
We have also seen interference by Canadian diplomats in our internal affairs. We've said this from this uh, podium, and that is obviously unacceptable. India has consistently alerted the US, Canada and the UK on the dangers posed by Khalistani extremists on their soil. Indian missions have been vandalized, diplomats targeted. And repeated requests of extradition of six separatists have been turned down. In Delhi, Kadambini Sharma for NDTV. And the U.S. takes very seriously the allegations against an Indian government official who's accused of directing an unsuccessful plot to assassinate a Sikh separatist on U.S. soil. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has said that on the U.S. Justice Department's indictment, Blinken has gone on to say that it is an ongoing legal matter and the United States is looking forward to seeing the results. Federal prosecutors in Manhattan have gone on to say that Nikhil Gupta, age 52, worked with the Indian government employee whose responsibilities included security and intelligence on the plot to assassinate a resident of the New York City who advocated for a sovereign Sikh state in northern India. Finally, with regard to India, um, first, this is a, an ongoing legal matter, so you understand I can't comment on it in detail. I can say that this is something we take very seriously. Um, a number of us um, have raised this directly with the Indian government uh, in, uh, in past weeks. Uh, the government announced today that it was uh, conducting an investigation, uh, and that's good and appropriate, and we look forward to seeing the results. In the latest uh, from the Gaza Strip, eight more Israeli hostages have been freed. Uh, this was day seven of the truce on Thursday with Hamas. Two hostages released on Wednesday were also counted in Thursday's tally. And Israel says it's freed 30 more Palestinian prisoners from jails in Israel in return. On the other hand, the United States has said that its immediate focus is to extend the pause. The seven-day truce between Israel and Hamas is due to expire in the coming hours, and it's not very clear if that will be extended. But according to reports, Hamas is willing to further extend a truce for hostages and prisoner exchange, and the United States has urged Israel to set up safe zones for Gaza civilians as a pause in their deadly war nears the expiry. Now, the United States says that the immediate focus will be to extend that temporary pause. In uh, more news, uh, Google will be paying Canadian news publishers $73 million a year in order to keep news in search results. My colleague Sakshi Bajaj has all the details. Canada and Google have struck a deal to keep news stories in search results. What this essentially means is that global tech giant Google will share revenue with publishers and continue to allow access to Canadian news content on its platform. As part of this deal, Google will pay $73.6 million annually to news publishers in Canada. The deal comes after months of talks between the search giant and Canada. While many believe this deal has put to rest concerns over Canada's online news, news law that seeks to make large internet companies share advertising revenue with news publishers, Canada's heritage minister has said that they're glad they found a path forward with Google for the implementation of the Online News Act. Thank you, Sakshi, for getting us all those details. But that was living a very short break. We'll be back with a whole lot more on the other side. Welcome back. Getting you more news now from uh, this time from uh, Srinagar. The National Institute of Technology there has been closed and the students have been asked to leave the campus and the hostel following tension over alleged post that was made, a sensitive post by a non-local student. All other colleges across Kashmir have been shot for physical classes and they've been directed to start online classes from today. And uh, this is an order that says that the mess services in the campus will also remain suspended from breakfast onwards. In another order issued by Higher Education Department, all the degree colleges have been directed to start online classes from tomorrow. The government has cited an early onset of winter as a reason for closing regular classes in college, even as high schools and higher secondary schools continue to remain open for regular classes in Kashmir. So this is, uh, a, you know, we can see visuals of how the campus is being shut down. People are being asked uh, uh, to uh, go back. Uh, this is uh, the campus of the NIT, the National Institute of Technology, uh, has been closed and students were asked to leave the campus as well as the hostel facility. All other colleges across Kashmir have also been shut. Uh, all students, boys and girls, are directed to leave the campus hostel by or before 10 o'clock uh, today morning. 
Uh, that is what a uh, notice uh, that was put up by the Dean Students Welfare uh, read at NIT. We have Nazir joining us. Uh, Nazir, take us through what's led to this early winter vacation in colleges is how the authorities are putting it. Even though schools are still open, what was that uh, you know, sensitive message all about? Well, uh, these uh, the visuals are uh, actually from a few days back when the actually controversy happened. The situation is now largely under control and the NIT Srinagar has been shed for the regular classes. They have now announced the winter vacations for the other colleges in Srinagar following uh, the massive protests and which actually took the administration by surprise. It happened on Tuesday when uh, social media posts, social media posts, which led to protests and the counter protests in the NIT Srinagar. Police immediately filed an affair against the students for allegedly hurting the, uh, the sentiments of the NIT students. This is the police infected with the people. I was studying at this particular class in Jammu, and he clearly said, Whoever tries to disturb peace, whoever tries to, you know, cause harm to the communal harmony, they will take a strict action against them and they will absolute respect and reverence for the Prophet Muhammad. So he said that nothing is actually tolerated from any side, whether these are from terror groups, separatists, or anyone who disturbs peace here. They will not be tolerated. Action will be taken. It means that uh, certain new, you know, laws will be introduced to deal with this thing. In fact, uh, the, the government has been using you know, all the social media users not to put any, you know, videos or the content on the social media. Even the comments right. have also been said they cannot. Right, uh, Razi, thank you so much for getting us all those details. We'll keep tracking the story and getting uh, Nazir back with us for more on that. Moving on to more news now and coming from the Delhi uh, region where uh, AQI continues uh, to be in the very poor category today. It is in the severe category in various areas when we talk about uh, uh, Vivek Vihar in Delhi is recorded 436, Nehru Nagar at 430. Uh, Delhi has seen no improvement in terms of the pollution levels uh, when it's coming in as far as the overall picture is concerned. It's about 383, which basically means it's not in the severe category. But then we have Vivek Vihar, we have Nehru Nagar, we have Oakland 423, we have Patpat -Pat Ganj coming at 416, Punjabi Bagh at 409, uh, Anand Vihar, Mundka, as well as other areas of the national capital where the AQI is above 400 points. And what uh, uh, we are hearing is that the situation is only going to worsen on Saturday for the next six days and that is on accord of the weather condition. The contribution from the stubble burning is minimal uh, but it is a weather condition. Do remember that it had rained and improved the air quality. Uh, it rained on Tuesday and it improved the air quality but uh, it added moisture in the air which is why uh, you can see that fog effect and that smog effect uh, from earlier this morning. Well, breaking news coming in and Nifty hits an all-time high, a record high and has crossed the 20,000 point. It's 20,222 to be precise. Uh, well, uh, Sakshi, get us the numbers from, uh, have we seen the markets uh, get this high and has it been as high since, uh, say, September? That's right, Divya. A fabulous, really fabulous Friday for the markets and all-time high for the Nifty crossing that 20,222 uh, mark. Remember, it's a fresh all-time high. The Nifty last hit this high, 20,222 level in September, on September 15th to be precise. So ever since then, really a fresh record high. Remember, we've been seeing markets cheering a flood of IPOs. We've been seeing a broad-based rally, really. Investors have been cheering the fact that small cap, mid cap indices have been outperforming as well. We've seen Nifty Realty, Nifty Metal, all outperforming. So really a broad-based rally is what investors and analysts alike have been cheering. Now, of course, what analysts are also attributing this to is, of course, strong GDP data that came in just last evening, remember, better than expectations at 7.6% for the second quarter. So all of these factors really uh, you know, clocking in. And of course, remember all BSE listed stocks, just a few days ago, we saw the fact that all BSE listed stocks touched that you know, 4 trillion mark. And of course, so fresh high really for markets, investors during a slew of factors for both macro as well as stock related action.